Good morning, everyone. Um, we're about to begin, so we'd like you to take your seats. If we could have the technical working group up here in the front, that would be helpful. Uh, they'll be here to answer any questions from this microphone, guys. So if uh, the panel has a question at the end that they can't answer, you come here and answer the question. Um, so we want to welcome you this morning. Um, our live uh, production will be beginning in just a couple of minutes. And, uh, and I just wanted to remind you if you could turn off your cell phones. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to St. Petersburg College Seminole Campus and welcome to the Wastewater Stormwater Partnership Meeting. My name is Dr. Lisa Borzuski. I am the Associate Provost here at the Seminole Campus and we at St. Petersburg College are deeply proud to be a part of this partnership by hosting you for this event. You are in the University Partnership Center, the C. W. Bill Young University Partnership Center, and that name really tells you a little something about how important our connection to the community really is. We are very proud and happy to participate in something that is so important, and the work that you are doing today and that you have been doing and will continue to do is critical to our community. So thank you for your work, thank you for your effort, and we are very glad to have you. I'm also very proud to welcome our Commissioner, Charlie Justice. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Borzuski. We appreciate your hospitality. And I want to welcome you to the fifth meeting of the Wastewater Stormwater Partnership Steering Committee here in the Digitorium of St. Petersburg College. The partnership would like to extend our thanks to our Provost, uh, Mark Strickland, and of course, St. Pete College President, Dr. Tanja Williams for the continued partnership in supporting our meetings. They've allowed us to hold our meetings here and they've provided staff and technical support at this great venue, so we're very appreciative. I wanna recognize a few folks this morning. Uh, we have, uh, part of our partnerships is with the University of South Florida, and I'd like to thank Jesse Hillman, a USF student, and Dr. Mahmoud Nachvi, professor of civil engineering with USF for their valuable research on inflow and infiltration. If you would stand and be recognized. We appreciate their work and their partnership. I'd also, before uh, I get to my remarks, I'd like to recognize and thank you for being here, uh, Mayor George Credicus from the city of Clearwater. Thank you, Mayor, for being here. <laughs> Mayor Alan Johnson from the city of St. Pete Beach. Thank you, Mayor, we appreciate you being here. And from the Seminole City Council, our host today, uh, Councilman Jim Quinn. Thank you, sir, for uh, your participation as well. Before we get to our update, I want to provide you some background and context for what we're doing today. The Wastewater Stormwater Partnership was formed as a task force in October of 2016 to bring together representatives of Pinellas County, our municipal partners, community agency partners, in order to collaborate in addressing our critical wastewater and stormwater infrastructure needs. The partnership is made up of the steering committee of elected officials and policymakers, and the technical working group whose members include county and municipal experts in wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. If we could have our steering committee members stand to be recognized this morning, if you would stand please. And now members of our technical working group as well. Same group, all right, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate uh, all the time that people put in to be involved in this very collaborative effort. Out of initial action plan developed in January of 2017, the partnership identified three primary goals for our wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. One, avoiding and mitigating spills. 
increasing treatment capacity and system resiliency, and seeking opportunities to address drainage issues that affect the sanitary sewer system, as well as the overall goal of better communication and collaboration. Members of our technical working group are here to provide updates about the work that has been completed, work that is underway, as well as discuss future plans to further address these areas. Today's presenters include Megan Ross, Utilities Director for Pinellas County, Ray Bowler, Public Works Director for the City of Safety Harbor, Paul Micellis, Watershed Section Manager for Pinellas County, Dave Porter, Public Utilities Director for the City of Clearwater, and Claude Tankersley, Public Works Administrator for the City of St. Petersburg. And now, I'll turn it over to our first presenter, Megan Ross. Thank you, Commissioner Justice, and good morning. Um, again, my name is Megan Ross, Utilities Director for Pinellas County. We are pleased to be here today presenting to the steering committee the progress that the Wastewater Stormwater Partnership has accomplished over the past year, as well as our future plans and goals. On this slide is our four topics that will be covered today in the progress update, but before we begin, again, I just want to thank Dr. Mahmoud Nashabi, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and Jesse Hillman, both from the University of South Florida, who provided valuable research on inflow and infiltration to the partnership committee. After the presentation, uh, they will be available at the back of the room to share their research and answer any questions you might have about it. Also, at the back of the room, we have our education coordinator, Shay Donovan, who is sharing public outreach and educational materials from many of the partners. I encourage you to stop by and learn about what we are doing to work with the public on this issue. The partnership has been working together for just about three years now, not only to maintain economic vitality, but to ensure a bright and successful future for Pinellas County, the local municipalities, businesses, and our citizens. Before I continue, I'd like to point out that there is a website you can visit that is shown here on this slide. If you are interested in learning more about the partnership, it's at www.pinellascounty.org slash task force. And in addition, this a video from today from the presentation as well as the slides from the presentation will be posted there. So I'd like to remind everyone again why we are here. Today worldwide, there are 780 million people without access to clean water. There are 2.5 billion, with a B, who do not have access to sanitation. These are staggering numbers. Lack of water and sanitation has a negative impact on both families and children, not only on public health, but it has a direct impact on the ability to get an education, to work, and thus to improve and build on the community as a whole. Building and maintaining a wastewater system takes more than concrete, tanks, pipes, processes, equipment, and people. It takes leadership, and that is what the partnership represents. Our elected officials and steering committee that are here today support the very foundation of our community, which is infrastructure. And we thank them for showing the leadership that is needed to support this critical infrastructure in Pinellas County and its cities. It is imperative that we either maintain or even better improve the water quality in our environment. Because for us, it's also directly correlated to our economic success. As you know, Pinellas County and our local municipalities are known worldwide for our beautiful beaches, 35 miles of coastline, which are at the core of our vibrant tourism industry. By investing in stormwater and wastewater infrastructure, the members of the partnership are investing in a strong and robust platform for economic development. So the partnership goals that were agreed upon uh, were simple, to avoid and mitigate spills overflows and releases of sewage into the environment, particularly to water bodies. Seek opportunities to address drainage and stormwater issues that impact our sewer system. Increase capacity and resiliency of collective sewer system and wastewater treatment infrastructure. The partnership focused on seven action plans that will be shown here under this umbrella that include the following. We have inflow and infiltration studies, system hydraulic bottlenecks, rehabilitation and replacement of infrastructure, stormwater drainage improvements, public dialogue, legislation, and resource sharing and maximization. So today we'll be focusing on some of these specific actions and plans to address four of these core elements of the action plan. The first is inflow and infiltration studies. 
These studies seek to identify specific areas where groundwater and stormwater enter into our dedicated wastewater systems when it rains. Inflow, and inflow is what enters into the wastewater system as a direct connection to the system. Infiltration is the groundwater that enters the wastewater systems through cracks and leaks in the pipes. These two types of intrusion into the system are what inundates the capacity of the wastewater system, thereby increasing the chances of overflows during wet weather events. <clears throat> the other three action plans that we'll be discussing are the results of the countywide stormwater model, which is aimed to identify specific areas of inflow into the wastewater system. We'll be talking about public outreach initiatives, which are aimed to keep harmful household items from getting into the wastewater system. We'll also be talking about a proposed framework for the private lateral legislation, which is aimed to address wastewater pipes on private property that can be contributing to infiltration. The goals of these action plans is to have a countywide strategic approach to wastewater and stormwater infrastructure in order to proactively address wet weather inflow and infiltration that causes wastewater overflows in the system. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter. Ray Bowler is the Public Works Director from the City of Safety Harbor, and he will be speaking in further detail on the inflow and infiltration studies and some of the results that we've obtained thus far. Welcome, Ray. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Ray Bowler, Public Works Director, City of Safety Harbor. And I'm updating you on I&I. And, &I. and as Megan had already mentioned, I&I &I is an acronym for inflow and infiltration. And most of this inflow we get is from rain events, when the stormwater system overcharges its system and then finds compromised wastewater systems and flows into our wastewater collections. And she mentioned infiltration is generally leaking into our groundwater pipes, our, where the groundwater generally in Pinellas County is about three or four feet below the ground surface. During our heavy rains in the summer, that level may be only about a foot. So more of our wastewater collection lines are then surcharged with that excess water. We have a short video. This is showing infiltration into a manhole. Again, during those summer months, when the groundwater starts to rise, more and more groundwater will penetrate into our system. The partnership has initiated many of our flow monitoring studies within our communities. Pinellas County has started a three-year program in South County, which includes 16 zones that'd be screen right. These areas are selected based on known existing problems. The intent of this sizing is to do monitoring in a neighborhood type size zone where we're able to collect data. The, we have a detailed analysis of each zone which is performed to, with specialized software that will be able to possibly show any of our sanitary sewer overflows and then find a way to mitigate those and improve our collection systems. Within this 16 zones, 126 flow monitoring devices were deployed. Screen left is a few locations in Largo with similar flow monitoring programs. These programs provide strategic ways to act upon our issues. They have predictive tools to identify possible sanitary sewer overflows. Methods are being developed to mitigate, and then it also prioritizes our most impaired systems. Excessive infiltration areas are being TV'd, and projects are being enacted to stop that infiltration. Higher priority impaired infrastructures are being scheduled for repair, relining, or replacement. Smoke testing, and we'll see a slide on that shortly, helps determine sources of inflow. Also, we are identifying areas for future investigation. And finally, we continue to monitor these areas even after our improvements to show the results of our actions. 
In Safety Harbor, we have 26 wastewater collection areas. We were using 24 flow monitoring devices, and we have four rain gauges. One specific area is our Bridgeport area. It's right off of 580 near the Oldsmar Bridge. Once a holistic assessment of the contributing areas are performed, specific site areas are being targeted. We call those hot spots. They're targeted for future investigation. Our partnership has continued to work together on this action plan. BP Restore funds were shared for individual monitoring programs as well as an overall stormwater assessment. Here's that smoke testing I was talking about. This one happens to be in Treasure Island. It helps show flaws in our system. The center shot is a normal result of a smoke testing in a sealed wastewater system. Within each home, plumbing systems have vent stacks and the sewer gases escape above the roof. Within homes, they have what's called P-traps and that will hold small amounts of water so that the gases do not enter the homes. If the gases are, um, if a resident sees any of the smoke coming into their home, they need to contact a plumber pretty soon and have uh, someone deal with it because you are getting sewer gases into that dwelling. The photo on the right is a faulty system. Perhaps this is just a clean out cap that is missing. And by replacing the clean out cap, it would prevent the rainwater from entering our wastewater system. It could also be that the private lateral that services that home is broken and is in need of repair. In all cases, the pressure that is used to move the smoke through the system is minimal, and it will not move any of the liquid into the home. This chart is a classic example of an I, &I graph. The flow monitoring systems that are used will, will, will show these. This one happens to be a 24-hour day from midnight to midnight. The chart is used to study these and so that we'll know where we are with each of our systems. A typical rain event, or actually we'll start with the blue line, which is a typical dry weather event. It shows a pattern of about 6 o'clock in the morning as, res as people start to wake up, taking their showers, and starting the day. The rain event are the gray bars. This is about a one-inch event, again, in Safety Harbor in the Bridgeport area in August of 2018, and it's from about 1 to 3 a.m. The red line is how the wastewater flow reacts to that storm event. Immediately after the rain, you'll see the spike. That's inflow into, from stormwater into our wastewater system. After some time, the flow will subside, and then we'll get, start to migrate into an infiltration system. And then to the screen right, it's back to a typical flow pattern. The numbers in the corner represent about 50,000 gallons of stormwater has entered our wastewater system on that one day and that one event. That's approximately the size of three in-ground pools entering our system that do not need to be there. These photos are of a lining projects happening in Pinellas Park. Each partner is acting on their individual monitoring programs and developing projects and working on them and completing them. Within the last three years, over 150 miles of lining have been installed throughout the county uh, by the members of this partnership. That's equivalent to a trip from here, Seminole, Florida, across the state to the Kennedy Space Center on Merritt Island. As we build momentum on our I, &I reductions, we're continuing to monitor smoke test, repair manholes. Obviously, this manhole needs to be repaired. We're finding those doing our smoke tests and other examinations, and we're doing other relining projects and rehabilitation projects. We've been designing, implementing, and completing projects. All of the municipalities and the county have been working hard to make progress on this initiative set forth by the steering committee. We are required to have contracts or negotiate contracts with engineers, consultants, and contractors. 
We go through this bidding phase to solicit con consultant engineers and construction services. These phases are, in, are very important and essential to what we do. They're in place by law to guarantee proper solicitation of services, but also it benefits the public works departments and the utility departments so they can secure their budgets to be properly funded and allocated to these very important infrastructure issues. We are glad and proud to share this collective progress. It is with the support of the Partnership Steering Committee and the other elected officials that we have collectively budgeted $724 million this fiscal year that funds what was necessary annually so we can continue to investigate, maintain, and repair our wastewater and our stormwater systems. Thank you, and now I'd like to bring forward Paul Macellis from Pinellas County. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the stormwater portion of the program. The objective is to identify potential stormwater drainage improvements that have direct benefits on the wastewater system. Um, this is focused on the first I of I and I, so we're looking at just the inflow portion. That's the fast response from the uh, graph that Ray showed you. Um, this photo shows one particular intersection, a flooded intersection. It does have wastewater manholes, wastewater pipes underneath it, and this can also be a, a source of the, uh, the, the inflow. Um, we used a four-step process to identify the put and, and rank the potential inflow locations. And this is step one, where we went through uh, and collected um, all the data from the various municipalities, including stormwater and wastewater data. Uh, we plugged that into a GIS system, um, but first we had to convert a whole bunch of different files from uh, GIS. Fr uh, GIS was fine, we brought that in. Um, we had map books, uh, PDFs. Uh, all that had to be digitized and brought in. We also had to align the nomenclature, so some people would call a manhole an MH, other people would call a manhole a manhole, so we ended up with one set of unified data across the county. And it included the municipal data, FDOT data, county data, and even the private wastewater service providers. <clears throat> um, we used the floodplain data also, that came in from the various watershed management plans around the county, and if we didn't have that, we supplemented that with the FEMA floodplain maps, um, and also an older study from uh, the early 80s that the county had. Initial screening is the second step, where this is one particular uh, mid-county watershed. The green areas uh, indicate um, wastewater assets that are not flood prone. The, the red ones, our flood prone wastewater assets. So based on this, we can start to uh, zero in on where we needed to uh, target our efforts. Um, in this particular watershed, there were 25% of the wastewater manholes were considered flood prone, and 36% of the uh, pump stations, wastewater pump stations, were also considered flood prone. So there's a lot of assets potentially underwater here. The secondary screening is the third step of the process, which identifies where inflow is likely. Um, we used flood depth as an indicator of frequency, so the logic here is that the deeper the flooding, the more often the manhole gets flooded. Uh, and we also used flood duration uh, as an indicator of severity. The, the longer manholes flooded, the more likely it is to experience inflow. Um, and we also started piling on other data on top of this. Uh, like the overflow locations, like the bottlenecks, which are basically a, a, a narrowing of the wastewater collection network uh, to help us identify where, we, where these project areas might be located. Um, we ended up with uh, more than 700 potential project areas. These do need to be verified. Um, and when we went through and, and we assembled them into two tiers. Tier one are basically those higher priority areas where we have really good data. Uh, tier two are the normal priori priority areas where we have, where we think we might be able to do something, but we didn't quite have enough data to support it. It doesn't mean that they're not valid projects, it just means that they're going to need a little bit more study to figure out if we can actually do something in those areas. Um, we also generated maps and supported this, uh, 
the mapping effort by providing each municipality with their own set of maps. If we zoom in on one of the red areas, this is what it looks like. You start layering up all the data, uh, it generates a sort of heat map. And those red and orange areas are areas we're going to be focusing in on to, to see what we can do to reduce the inflow. Um, this is an example of what we call a best management practice. It's a potential project that we can look at. Um, and in this case, we have a number of um, uh, potentially flooded wastewater manholes and a pump station that are within 50 feet of this, uh, of this pond. Water level comes up during a, during a severe rain event uh, and it inundates the, the, the manholes. Um, what we can do is a couple options here. We can investigate uh, increasing the outfall, the stormwater outfall from this pond, thus lowering water levels. That would also reduce the flood extents and the flood duration um, and the depth uh, within those wastewater facilities. Um, the other alternative is to consider hardening those uh, wastewater manholes by installing uh, rain trays to prevent the inflow directly into the, the manholes. Uh, this is another example of a project, a uh, stormwater project locally done here in um, Pinellas County. Uh, previously, all the stormwater runoff just went straight to the network. And in this case, we installed uh, an LID type thing, low impact development, green infrastructure, similar idea uh, as pervious. Uh, pervious concrete here, and what it does is it captures some of the runoff before it ends up in the, uh, the, the stormwater network uh, and inf infiltrates that. So um, similar, similar approaches can be considered for other projects, and uh, another thing that we'll be looking at when we do future stormwater projects is we'll be actively looking for wastewater inflow, and if they do exist within that stormwater project area, we can address that at the same time. The future plans here, we need to verify those 700-some uh, uh, identified project areas. Um, and as the additional information comes in, we can layer that on top and better refine these project area locations. So we're talking about the flow monitoring results. We can plug that in and see what happens. Pump station run times can also be added in, and that would be a surrogate or a proxy for um, inflow. So if you don't have a flow monitoring station, uh, you can look at what the pump station is doing immediately after a rainfall, and if it activates, then you know there's inflow within the system that that pump station serves. Um, the stormwater projects, like I mentioned, will be actively looking at ways of reducing inflow in, or into the wastewater system if it, if it does exist within that stormwater project area. Um, and we're continually working on updating our flood maps. So as those flood maps come in, we can redo this analysis and see how we can uh, better refine our efforts and target our efforts. Um, coordinating efforts between the various departments, uh, you know, public works and utilities will have to happen, uh, and it is happening now, um, but that's going to be a continued effort. So if one project can address multiple things like a reduction in the uh, road flooding, a reduction in flooded floors, reduction of inflow, these are definitely projects that we want to pursue. Um, so up next with the public dialogue segment it is uh, Ray Porter with the City of Clearwater. Oh, sorry. Close David enough. Porter. <laughs> Close enough. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Porter. I'm with the City of Clearwater, the uh, Public Utilities Director. Um, this morning, I'd like to talk to you about a very important uh, element of the work that the Wastewater Stormwater Partnership has been working on since its inception, um, and that is our public uh, outreach and dialogue program. You know, wastewater utility operations are influenced by many variables. Many of them we just can't control, and that's something like the weather or the storm pattern that we have to deal with. And when those things happen, we have to deal with them as they occur. So there are others, however, and some of the others can be controlled if we work effectively beforehand and we work with our public to find common solutions to some of the problems that we face. So, let me grab this thing. Okay. Um, there was supposed to be a slide there. There we go. All right. So, when grease and used um, oils and fats are discharged to the wastewater collection system, they congeal and they combine with non biodegradable matter um, to form something that is affectionately known as a fatberg. Uh, that term has only come into being in, in common uh, use within the last four or five years. 
because of a situation I'm gonna speak about in a moment. But fatbergs are very serious problems for our systems. Um, a fatberg is made up of those fats, oils, and greases when they combine with things like flushable wipes, which aren't. Flushable wipes is an improper name for that product. They are not flushable because when they do combine together, fatbergs um, like the ones you see in this picture occur and they literally plug the sewer system or pumps or other uh, important components of our wastewater collection system. So with that, I'd like to play a video. Um, whoop, go back one. Uh, we're Run here today, the video. Uh, to recognize a growing battle we have here in our sewer collection system. Um, it's wipes or disposable wipes, things that are sold in the grocery store as disposable. They get caught up in our lift stations and caught up in our sewer pipelines. Every day we have two crews that go around and maintain over 100 lift stations. Every day we have over you know, 10 to 12 lift stations that the pumps get gummed up with, with the wipes. Today, just a short amount of time, we come across a station that had three five-gallon buckets worth of wipes. So the main reason we're here is to get this out to uh, the public and the people in the community of Pinellas Park. Um, there's a lot of products advertised as flushable, but please do not use these. Uh, stick to uh, what we know is flushable and what deteriorates fast, and that's the toilet paper. Okay, um, as you can see, that's a video that Pinellas Park put together to help educate and uh, ask for the help of their um, citizens. Um, all of the partners are producing similar products in one way or another, which I'll talk about here in a second, but fatbergs and the use of flushable wipes and flushing fat soils and grease down the sewer are a major cause of the overflows that we see during non-storm events here in our systems. So what are some of the things that the partnership um, has been doing? Um, these are some examples of the um, outreach program components that we've put together uh, throughout our partnership group um, to uh, help address and help uh, educate our folks as to how they can help us. Um, the program such as SPATMAN, uh, which you see a second from the right, is a program, a, a character that's been developed by the city of Clearwater that we use and provide materials for. And there's a number of the packets up here on the front if anybody would like to have one. Uh, we send to teachers, and the teachers in our school system participate in helping us get the message out. The children um, are taught why it's not a good idea to put fats, oils, and grease down the sewer system. And then they take that information home, and it's pretty effective, I, I will tell you. We've had uh, a number of folks come up to us at various events and say, you know, my child brought home this information. I wasn't aware of this. So it's worked very well for us, and it's been a program we've had for many years. And the kids like the character. So we have coloring books and a number of things that we use to get the message out. So it's a very effective program. Um, so one more thing that our customers can do, other than fats, oil, and grease, to you know, not limit, it, uh, limit the amount that goes into the sewer and also to prevent flushable wipes from going in the system, is to just limit the amount of water that you use during a major storm event. We have a major storm event. If you can limit the amount of water you use to just that necessary, that produces less sewage that we have to treat along with all of the inflow and, and infiltration that we're dealing with and helps us to help prevent um, stormwater or wastewater, I'm sorry, wastewater overflows from our, our wastewater collection system during a storm event. Okay. These are examples of some additional types of materials that, and, and things that we do to get the message out. Uh, we've all produced a number of different types of brochures on a number of topics, um, such as, again, the FOG, F-O-G, fats, oils, and grease going into the sewer system. We've had issues about the wipes and many other things that we deal with. We often send those out uh, with bills. We hand them out at various civic functions. We go to homeowners associations and hand them out. Um, they're very effective in passing the message out in a very short period of time. Uh, we also, today, use social media. We all have social media campaigns that we do to get the message out in various ways, like Facebook and Twitter and some of the others, um, and through our web pages. Um, so there's quite a bit of work that goes on there. We also um, 
participate in many civic events. City of Clearwater has a, pro, has a civic event called Neighborhoods Day, which is a wonderful thing. We have many neighborhood parties that occur on the same day throughout the entire city of Clearwater that each one of the homeowners groups puts on. And we, the city officials, go from, from party to party to party the entire day and visit with the folks to pass out information, ans answer questions, and this is always some of the most important information that we hand out. So it's very effective in getting our message out. Okay, um, the partnership members are very, are very active in community outreach programs throughout the entire area. Um, some of the events we've attended are things like Touch a Truck, which is uh, sponsored by one of our members, where our kids get to actually go out and see what these vehicles that we use to maintain the system look like and get to see them and sit in them and, and have uh, you know, interaction with our staff. We have the Citizens Academies, uh, the Civic Leadership Associations for high school kids, the Great American Teach-In, just any kind of an activity that we can do or we can get the message out and influence people, we attend them. In addition, the partnership members, the web pages provide information about flushable white fog and the water conservation, and each one of our members has their own web page. Okay, so the partnership has developed a branded social media campaign to educate the public about what to flush and what not to flush down the sewer. This branded campaign relies on messages in a humorous and fun way uh, while making the point. The campaign was launched this morning and we are currently populating the web base um, with the information that we have available that can be used by each municipality's public information officers so that they can step up the campaigns and get the message out to our folks. Um, some of that information is already being posted today on some of the social media sites. So with that, I would like to uh, play one last um, public outreach piece, a video done by Hillsborough County, and now is uh, being uh, released in conjunction with our partnership as a team effort to get the message out that don't flush it. So with that, would you roll the video, please? Flossing in the morning is a really great way to keep your teeth healthy and start the day. But when you're through, here's what you do. Throw it in the trash, don't flush it. There's a problem lots of people don't know. Called sanitary sewer overflow A condition buried deep in the ground Inside a pipe where bad clogs are found It's a problem we can all help solve So throw it in the trash, don't, don't flush it. it Baby wipes, bandages, cotton pads Paper towels, dental floss, clog up bad Medicines, kitty litter, cotton swabs, hair Throw them in the trash, don't, don't flush it, it. It just takes a second to do the right thing So toss it and let's keep our pipes clean Throw it in the trash, don't flush it If it's not toilet paper, don't flush it Even if it says you can, don't flush it If you're having any doubts, don't flush it One more time, don't flush it <laughs> Pretty effective piece and thank you to Hillsborough County for taking the lead on developing that piece and for allowing us to share it and utilize it. Um, that's an example of a great team effort that even crosses the county lines. So we're all working together for the same thing. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Claude Tankersley with the city of St. Petersburg, who's going to talk to you about legislation. Thank you. Thank you, David. I don't know about you guys, but I'm probably going to be singing Don't Flush It for the rest of the day. <laughs> you may have noticed during our presentation here that we, we tried to start large. We tried to start countywide, communitywide. And we've been slowly getting more and more narrow to the individual. We just talked about how we as the Utilities and the municipalities and the county are trying to educate our citizens. And now I'd like to talk about a specific citizen initiative that would be very important for our success. Uh, you know, you, we often hear, hear that um, people who live in glass houses should not throw stones. And so for the past three years, 
the county and the municipalities and utilities have been taking care of our own houses. Uh, earlier, we mentioned that this fiscal year we have over $700 million budgeted on our systems. Um, that's close to 1.5 to 2 billion in the last three years that we've been spending to get our house in order. But now it's time to talk about your house, my house, all of our individual houses, all of our individual businesses, because we all play a role. Statistically, studies throughout the United States have shown that private systems, private laterals, contribute anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of the inflow and infiltration into public systems. That's a big range. We really don't know what it may be here in this area. One of the things that the city of St. Petersburg is doing to determine that is we are undergoing a pilot study right now where we are going into two neighborhoods and we are treating, uh, we're separating the neighborhood into a control group and a study group. The control group we're leaving alone. We're not doing anything in that, in that area. We're measuring the flows in the sewer system. But in the study group, we're going in and we are working with the homeowners in that study group to repair or replace their private laterals and measuring the flows in those systems. And then hopefully in two years when we finish this, we'll compare the, the data to see what kind of an impact does it have for homeowners and business owners to fix their private laterals. Let's see where we are in that 30 to 70 percent. In order for us to move forward with this more effectively though, one of the things that we need to do as a team and as a region and as the individual utilities is come up with a, what's called a private lateral ordinance. And this ordinance is very important uh, for many reasons and one of the reasons that we're working on this concurrently as a team is that we are a, we are a county that is comprised of many municipalities and many utilities and the last thing we want to do is confuse our citizens by having an ordinance, let's say in St. Pete, that requires one thing, and an ordinance in Clearwater that requires a different thing, and an ordinance within unincorporated Pinellas County that requires a third thing. We're trying to avoid that. So we're working together to come up with a base standard ordinance that each of the utilities and municipalities can adopt. Obviously, each of us can tweak it for our specific situation, but it's something that we could all have a, as a base. And, and what does this ordinance do? The ordinance establishes certain principles. The very first and most important principle that the ordinance would establish is the affirmative responsibility of homeowners and business owners to maintain their private laterals. Now you may think, well, that, that, that seems logical. Yes, it does seem logical common sense, but we need to establish that in an ordinance that people have that affirmative responsibility. Many of us have in our ordinances, as a matter of fact, I think all of us do, the, um, we, we outlaw the introduction of storm water into our public sanitary sewer. And so that kind of gets us there, but it doesn't get us all the way there. So in addition to having the, the current prohibition against introducing storm water into our systems, we need to establish the affirmative responsibility for homeowners to maintain their system and not to introduce stormwater into ours. But another thing we have to do is we have to respect the Constitution. And the Constitution of the United States has the Fourth Amendment, which protects us against unreasonable seizure and, and um, inspection. And quite frankly, we cannot just march right into somebody's home and inspect their home and inspect their laterals without establishing that right because otherwise it may be interpreted as unreasonable search and seizure. So the ordinance must establish and will establish that municipalities and utilities have the right to insist that homeowners and businesses keep and maintain their systems and inspect their systems and if they refuse to do so, then the municipality and the utility has the right to find other ways to inspect it. The, the inspection concept will allow us to establish who does the inspection, how the inspection is done, and what the schedule might be for our inspection. We also need to define in these ordinances what is a defect. 
Just because your private lateral might have a crack, that doesn't necessarily mean that your private lateral is introducing storm water into the system. Common sense tells us it would, but there may be certain circumstances where it may not. And so we need to make sure that we establish what a defect is so that our citizens know that we are treating them fairly and that we are not imposing something on them that is unreasonable. We also need to establish what remediation is. And again, we'll ask the who, the method, and the schedule. And finally, we have to establish what compliance looks like. And for compliance, there's two ways to enforce compliance. One is with a carrot and one is with a stick. I believe each of our municipalities and utilities may come up with our own unique carrots, but for the stick, we probably need to have a similar approach to each other. So some of the ideas that we're looking at, the first one is a point of sale requirement. And so this idea is that whenever you sell a home, that you have to have your private lateral inspected. While this can be very helpful for homes that are overturned on a regular basis, if you have a home that hasn't been sold in several decades, then you might miss the boat for those kind of homes. So it has its pluses and its minuses. And sometimes there's some groups, uh, uh, particularly uh, we've heard from the, the real estate groups that are concerned about adding this requirement to the home sale process. The home sale process is, those of you who've gone through it, it's not the easiest thing in the world. And so they're concerned by adding this additional burden to the home sale process to have the point of sale inspection. So another possibility is a regular inspection and correct. Come up with a, a plan for regular inspections, either by the homeowner or by the municipality, and a correction to be made when those inspections are made. Another idea has been to create a public database so that um, this information can become public so that if you're looking to buy a home, you can go to a public database and look up to see that home that you're interested in. When was the last time it was inspected? When was the last time the lateral was replaced? It gives you more knowledge as a, as a smart buyer uh, so that you'll know going, going through the process what's ahead for you. And finally, one of the things we're looking at also is a warranty program. And this is a program that uh, you, you may have seen or heard about where you can actually buy a, a warranty where you pay a monthly fee to a, a third party vendor who will provide you a warranty on your, your private lateral. And we've actually gone through an RFP to discuss this with several different vendors and we're working towards perhaps establishing one. So these are the ways that we're gonna be working to, to get this ordinance established and we hope to get it done over the next year and we look forward to getting your feedback on it. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to discuss this with you today, to wrap us up and pull us back all together. Uh, Megan Ross from Pinellas County Utilities. Thank you, Claude. So going forward, we will diligently continue to accomplish the action plan and do the necessary maintenance and upgrades to the wastewater and stormwater infrastructure that is so vital to this community. However, as we've stated earlier, it is so important to educate the public about what they can do at home to protect the wastewater systems and ultimately the environment. As you have seen today, many spills that can cause environmental impact can be caused by grease flushable wipes that should not be flushed and other materials that should not go down the drain at all. We need your help to spread the message about what not to flush. So please visit our tables and please help us get that word out. In closing, I want to thank Commissioner Justice, all of the steering committee members, and all of our elected officials for their support of the partnership, and all of the members who diligently participated in our technical working group, the Wastewater Stormwater Partnership. We, together, we are working towards achieving our public outreach goals and utilizing the public to work together. So at this time, I'd like to invite Commissioner Justice back up to the podium to facilitate a question and answer session with the technical working group. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Before I do that, I want to recognize a couple other elected officials who came in. We have uh, Mayor Brown from the city of Largo. We appreciate you being here, sir. <laughs> Mayor Alhusas of Tarpon Springs, thank you. Good to see you. And Mayor Bradbury from the city of Pinellas Park. Thank you for being here. 
So you talked about the song that you were going to have playing in your head the rest of the day. I'm thinking about how we could challenge the Avenger movie with Spatman. So uh, I think we're missing an opportunity here, City of Clearwater. Uh, let's open it up to questions. Do you have some questions or thoughts you want to share with the committee? We have microphones at the front, so please come forward. Don't be shy. Well, let me, let me throw a question to you then uh, while they're formulating the courage to come forward. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the prioritization? We talked about the maps. We talked about those red spots and the priority projects. But how are each, uh, each entity going to go through and how are we as a partnership going to prioritize which pipes need to be aligned first, which projects need to be tackled first? Whoever wants to tackle it. Yeah, so is this on? Yeah. So I can start. Um, as you saw, some of these studies, both the flow monitoring study that actually measures the amount of flow in our wastewater system at different points during these rain events, combined with the stormwater model, really paints a picture as far as where are those what we call hot spots. We're actually seeing that specific areas within the county and the cities that are contributing significant flows. So for example, I, I think we saw it on one of the slides, there's one spot that's contributing one and a half million gallons per day when it rains, just in one area. That's one and a half million, that's about 6% of our total normal flow to one of our wastewater plants. So very significant. And that's how we're, we're using data to prioritize instead of just you know, going all over the county and trying to fix everything we can, we're really targeting using data and data-driven decisions to target these areas to actually get that result of reducing that inflow and infiltration to the system. Hello, ah, there we go. <laughs> um, it, it, these flow monitoring, monitoring um, uh, the flow monitoring work we're doing is really showing some very interesting things that you wouldn't have thought previously, that we wouldn't have known. We've got in the city of Clearwater one little small area that comprises one mobile home park that when under normal conditions, we're seeing about seven to 10,000 gallons per day coming from the park. But during a rainstorm, we see as much as 400,000 gallons a day. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but multiply that by all the different neighborhoods that we have. And it, you know, when you have that kind of a problem, it's a big problem. So. Now we're starting to see the, the, the benefits and start to see the, uh, um, the help that we get from the monitoring uh, programs we put into place that we wouldn't have seen previously. So that, that whole system has worked very well. I'd like to also say that the work that the stormwater group has done to try to predict where will you see flooding in the streets relative to where are the wastewater infrastructure. I don't think anyone's ever done that before. I've never seen it in the 47 years I've been doing this. And when it first came up in the group, I was, I said, Matt, you know, that just makes perfect sense. I, I was so shocked that no one had ever thought to do that before. Um, but the work Paul and his group have done is truly amazing. It really gives us a picture of where we can expect to see inflow. It's not the only picture, but it's a picture. And like I said, I don't know anyone else that's ever done that. I know it's getting a lot of interest from other groups in other parts of the United States. So it's a great program. It's homegrown. It's from the partnership. And it's really going to do a lot for us going forward. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got to turn my, oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. So um, in the city of St. Petersburg, we have approximately 100,000 parcels. Uh, each of those parcels are contributing to our system. But the city itself owns approximately 800 of those 100,000. <clears> and so talking earlier about how making sure that we get our own house in order, what we've been doing is, is going to each of those parcels that the city owns and testing the stormwater and the wastewater systems to make sure there's no cross connections. And we found some. Uh, one of the most significant ones, we found a, a parking garage downtown that uh, belongs to the city, and uh, when it was uh, when the when it was built, the contractor accidentally connected the stormwater system for the parking garage directly to our wastewater system. So during a one-inch rain event, we would get almost 100,000 gallons of stormwater going directly into our wastewater system. We never knew about it. So um, so combining the stormwater and this and this and the wastewater, looking at them both together 
is, a, is an important thing we're doing to try to make sure that we tackle this issue. Absolutely. That, that looking at our own house first is a critical component of building the public trust in anything we move forward with. So, excellent point. Questions from our audience? Mayor, I see him. He's ready to go. Commissioner Justice, I'm not really going to ask a question, but I'm going to thank you and the task force for, you know, we, we had a problem that developed a couple of years ago, and we were all embarrassed by it. But rather than sitting down and calling each other names like they do in Washington sometimes, <laughs> we decided that we would tackle the issue. So on behalf of the city of Clearwater, I want to thank you, the county, all of our municipalities for coming together on this and realizing, you know, it, it's not to use a trite phrase, this isn't really sexy stuff, you know. But it's things that need to get done. And it's things that we don't, you know, as regular citizens don't even think about. It's just more convenient for us to flush without thinking or to put grease down, down our, 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 our sinks and whatever. So we need to continue to get that word out. And I think by all of us working together and, and the leadership that this task force is providing is going to help us be able to do our job. And, and on behalf of the city of Clearwater, and I'm sure my other, you know, colleagues want to say thank you for, for that. I appreciate that, Mayor. And And really, that was, when we first met, that was the number one thing we wanted to do was to increase the communication and collaboration so that we wouldn't have some of the problems. I mean, some of those will always exist, but we wanted to be able to address them better as a, a unit together. And when county administration was thinking of someone who could tackle something unsexy, they immediately thought of me. So, <laughs> any other questions? One, one thing I want yes, to sir. The uh, public relations out piece, the Don't Flush It song, that's trying to make it sexy. <laughs> All right. All right. Mayor Johnson. I, I also want to, you know, join George in uh, thanking you guys for doing this. What, the one thing I'd like to know is that as a small municipality like St. Pete Beach, we, we've been doing a lot of work on sewer systems for the last about eight to ten years now and put tens of millions of dollars into it. What I'd like to do is, is there any help we can get from the county to do the outreach stuff that you've done, like the videos and the, and the hang tags, all that kind of stuff? Can we get some help in, in creating that kind of stuff for our, 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 our residents so that we can get the word out? Because uh, I'm sure that I'm, I've got my <laughs> public works director that came today, and uh, I wonder how many fat burgers we have you know, running around our system. So we'd like to get rid of that. So. I can answer that, and just this morning, as Dave mentioned, we've launched a comprehensive PIO campaign, so a toolkit that basically is posting all kinds of information like these videos and other things that can just be easily dropped, downloaded, and posted on your Twitter, your Facebook, your social media, and we absolutely would be happy to help with that. So yes, that's, that's the idea. We all want to have the same message. So. Yeah, and actually come talk to us after because we have some handouts here and that'll get into more detail and our PIO, uh, Libby Bowling, is here and can, and can really work with you on specifically how to get that information. Absolutely, kind of can make the boilerplate available and you can plug in your personal information on there to make it uh, more user friendly for you. All right, so I'll give the committee up here a chance for closing remarks, if you'd like. I just have one. Um, again, I want to thank the committee, the steering committee, and our elected officials. Again, that funds that we get, it, they are very important for us to be able to do our jobs. One thing that I was able to find out is what I don't know. Um, the county has an area where they're going to, to uh, they know where there's some problems and they're addressing those, but it's the ones that we don't know. And doing these studies and these monitorings of where the water is coming from helps us direct us to areas that we're not aware of because it's the unknown that all of a sudden you have a major collapse because you weren't doing this investigation. So again, thank you for helping us do our job. I think, uh, I think all of us would share that same sentiment. Um, if it weren't for the leadership of the folks that we report to, the elected officials and the um, management teams in the various cities and, and, uh, and the county, we wouldn't have been able to 
do the work that we've done because it was with your leadership, your support, and the funding that you've provided us to get this work done that we've been able to get to do what we've done. And we're continuing to do it. So again, I want to echo that too. This is truly a partnership, a partnership that runs from the citizens that we serve all the way to the very tops of our governments and, and back and forth. So it's been an excellent um, uh, program so far. I only envision it getting better with time, so thank you. Anyone else? You know, we may not ever be able to make this sexy, and I, I certainly understand <laughs> that. Uh, but sometimes we might be able to make it less scary. And I think that's really where we're trying to get to. Uh, one of the things that, that we successfully piloted recently <clears throat> was using dogs. Cute dogs. Everybody loves dogs. And there, um, there are some dogs out there that have been trained to be able to smell human waste. So we had them come in and do a pilot in our city in an area that we suspected we had a cross connection between our storm sewer and our wastewater system, but we couldn't find it. And so we had the dogs walk the street and go from, uh, go from storm sewer to storm sewer manhole and sniffed around. And sure enough, by sniffing around, we found where we did have a cross connection, where we had raw sewage going into our stormwater system through a cracked pipe. But by doing it this way with the dogs, uh, the neighborhood came out and like, okay, what are y'all doing? Why are all these dogs walking around here? And the kids were excited. The, the, the parents were fascinated. And we were able to get our word out and the message out while we were doing it. So there's a lot of creative ways out there that we can make this less scary for the public. There you go. I just learned something new. I didn't know there was wastewater sniffing dogs. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this partnership is all about. I just... Thank you. That's a good piece of information. Every dog at the Pinellas County Animal Shelter can do that, so you can go out and adopt one today. And no dogs, Dave. <laughs> oh, come on, Bill. Just one. Anyone else? All right. I don't want to belabor the point. We really appreciate uh, your attendance this morning. Uh, please stick around, talk with our panel, uh, panel individually, come up to the table, see some of the displays, uh, and interact. And as we continue this great collaboration and partnership, and again, I want to thank you for uh, your excellent leadership and hard work on this as we continue to move forward to serve Pinellas County and our public. Thank you very much for being here. Have a great day.